Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you on this Tuesday in June. Can you believe we're in June already? I can, I guess, because the calendar says it's June, but um, this year is just zipping about, zipping a by, <laughs> zipping by, zipping away, something just made up a new word. Uh, as I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I do have an interview today with Carl, Carl excuse me, Vondero about his debut novel, Murderabilia. This book comes out July, uh, July 8th. It is a thriller. Let me read you the uh, description. Um, William McNary was eight years old when his father went to prison. Since then, he's carefully built a life as a family man and a private banker for the wealthy. He tries to forget that his father dismembered and photographed 13 women, and he tries to forget those exquisitely composed photos of severed hands, heads, and feet that launched the murderabilia art market. William has not spoken to his father for 31 years. No one at his Tony Bank knows whose son he is. Not until his wife's colleague is murdered and carved up in the same way his father would have done it. Only one person can understand the copycat killer. The monster William hasn't seen since he was a child. So that is the description of Murderabilia by Carl Vondero. As I said, it is a thriller, which I'm sure you could have guessed from that description. This is a creepy page turner. It is... Um, it's it's layered in a lot of ways because it, it is that thriller. There is um, this copycat killer that is now threatening William's family. But there are layers because you get William's backstory in terms of having lived with a father who was a serial killer. He lived with him until he was eight. His sister was 13. Um, it, so you get that backstory of... William, his sister, and their mother living with this man who they loved and who was part of their family and, and in many ways loving and kind to them. And then they find out that he has done these horrible things. So you get that backstory. And those uh, the backstory is intertwined with the current story as things are playing out. So you start to understand William more. You start to understand his relationship with his sister, with his mother with his father whom he hasn't seen in 31 years and it's just this this great like i said layering this building up of both of these stories the backstory and then this current story where you have a copycat killer and uh there is suspicion laid on william because he is the son of this uh, of a serial killer and the 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 police figure well who else would know this killer better than his son um so that and that's just that's just the beginning. <laughs> then then the story goes on from there, and uh, you know I'm not going to give anything away. But uh, then you know you have to find out who the real killer is, and it takes a while. Lots of lots of lots of stuff happens. <laughs> so we are going to turn now to that interview with Carl because he can explain more. And uh, we talk about murderabilia and what that is. We talk about the story. We talk about the layers, etc. So let's go ahead and turn to that interview. Before we do, I do want to mention that I have copies of this to give away. It doesn't come out, as I said, until July 8th. But if you would like to read it beforehand, I do have copies to give away. So stay tuned until the end of this podcast to find out how you can win a copy of Murderabilia by Carl Vondero. And now we go ahead and turn to that interview with Carl. Hi, Carl. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. 
I am really excited to talk about your new book, which is called Murderabilia. Before we get to the book, though, um, if you could share a little bit about yourself so my listeners could get to know you a bit. Sure, sure. Um, I grew up in Cleveland with a religious family, uh, Christian Zionists, and uh, from there I escaped Cleveland and went to school at Stanford. Uh, all the while, I was um, I was actually writing music at the same time. So I graduated in economics, and then I studied music for a year at San Jose State, much to my parents' uh, delight. <laughs> um, and then uh, I uh, ended up going into banking, where I spent my whole career. And I worked in the U.S. as well as Canada, Latin America, and North Africa. Um, I've been writing for a long time, uh, really for almost 30 years, and um, in that time, you know, I, f I finally got my first book published, being Murderabilia. I am uh, married and I have two boys. Okay, wow, thank you. Um, so let's let's talk about that book, uh, Murderabilia. What was your inspiration for the story? Well, what I like to do is, or actually all my books uh, revolve around the banking industry, so there are mysteries in the banking industry, and I like to combine several things. I thought, well, if you were a private banker for the very wealthy, what would be a secret you wouldn't want your clients to know? Mm -hmm. And that secret might be that your father was a serial killer, a notorious serial killer, and uh, he is actually famous for taking photographs of his victims. Um, then I thought, well, I, I was raised a Christian scientist, so I would, I'd always wanted to put that as part of the story. And how could that be in it? Well, suppose the mother was a very devout Christian scientist and didn't believe that evil existed, which would both enable her husband to do some of his killings as well as, in a way, kind of protect her children from it. So I combined all those things together. Yeah, which makes for a very uh, that that tells us a lot and also tells us not much <laughs> because there's so many yeah. layers to this story. It's amazing. Um oh, before we get into some of the layers, uh can you talk a little bit about what murderabilia is and why people are so fascinated by it? Sure, sure. Well, I didn't discover it until I started writing the book. And, you know, I was looking for something despicable that his father could do, and that would be taking photographs of bodies that, of the women he'd, he'd killed. And I found that Harvey Glattman did that some time ago. And then I learned that there was something called murderabilia that has existed for a while, and that is basically collectibles used or owned by killers are sold in a market throughout the world. Uh, the Internet has just kind of um, has, it made this thing explode. Um, the person that uh, came up with the name, his name was Andy Cahan, and he was a victim's right advocate for the Houston Police Department. In the late 90s, he discovered that Arthur Showcross, um, a man that killed 14 people, was selling his paintings out of his cell. And so he uh, coined the term murderabilia. Um, it's a huge market. Uh, there are brokers, dealers, all kinds of convicts and killers that are involved in it all over the world. Um, the Supreme Court uh, has struck down state laws that tried to prevent it from happening. Um, and even Congress has put forward uh, some legislation to, to uh, eliminate it, but it's been unsuccessful. So now you have people uh, sell, buying and selling things like, say, from John Wayne Gacy. One of his clown paintings can sell for $175,000. Um, it's just amazing. Uh, Ted Bundy, I saw on one of these sites that his glasses were for sale for $75,000. Um, in Germany, they were selling the watercolors produced by Adolf Hitler for $450,000. So this goes on, uh, and people really don't know much about it. It's kind of secret. It's 
it's fascinating and um, a little repulsive and uh, just, wow, <laughs> I don't quite even know what to say about the whole process. Yeah. Um, it's it's you know? really creepy. It's really creepy. And if you uh, have a friend who has a uh, picture of a clown with an open red palm and red around the mouth and blue rimmed eyes and balloons and trees, you uh, you might start to ask some questions about them because it could be one of John Wayne Gacy's clown paintings. Wow. Uh, thankfully, I do not know of anybody in my, my <laughs> circle that has that painting that I know of. <laughs> oh, and, I mean, it, it's just weird stuff. Uh, Whitey Bulger, you know, he was captured and he was just killed in prison for the, being in the mob in, the mob in, in Boston. Uh, the U.S. Marshals actually sold his stuff. And this was like old sneakers, jewelries, little knickknacks. I don't know who benefited from the proceeds, but, you know, even the government is involved in this. Wow. Interesting. Charles Manson, there was a, he made a swastika from his hair. I mean, it's just, it just, you, you begin to tremble when you hear some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's strange. It's strange just all over. I mean, from the, well, from that, making a swastika from your own hair, but then the the, the mindset of the person that buys that, it, it's it's a little disturbing. <laughs> um, but it, does. it is. It, well, it is because, but in a way, it's been going on forever. Right. Um, you know, black magic with nail clippings and hair clippings, uh, snuff films, even cannibals. Um, you know, this, we've always been fascinated by this. In a way, it's sort of uh, a manner in which you acknowledge the existence of evil and try to control it. At the same time, you feel it and push it away. Mm -hmm. um, and and certainly my character in the book, William, he is trying to reconcile himself with it and push it away at the same time. It is time to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast, but you are starting to see how those layers are building up on each other in the story. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the main character, William. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden in the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip-hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further, because this is the gold standard in music podcast. <laughs> Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Carl Vondero about his debut novel, Murderabilia. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. So let's talk a little bit more about William as the protagonist. Um, what about him do you think will resonate with readers? Well, he has been trying to escape the, the crimes of his father for 31 years. And uh, when he was eight years old, his uh, father was arrested for killing 13 women and thrown in jail in Illinois, and William has not seen him since. But at the time, it totally shattered William's life, his sister, and his mother's life. Uh, they were instant pariahs in their towns. And uh, to escape that stigma, they changed their name and moved to California and pretended that they had no relationship at all to his father, Harvey Dean Cogan. Um, but at the same time, his photos were so notorious that they're all over the Internet. They're still all over the Internet. He has fan clubs, and um, it's always out there. It's never far from women's mind. Now he is a private banker, and he's just trying to live a normal life. He, he, uh, he does banking services for the very wealthy in San Diego, um, but no one where he works has any idea that his father is Harvey Dean Cogan. He has two young children, and they, of course, think that their grandfather is dead, have no idea the kinds of 
terrible things he did. And William would do anything to protect his children from the the kind of stigma that he suffered as a, as a child. Right. And so it all kind of comes together, William trying to do anything to protect his children, also to protect his identity, to protect his children, uh, the, the murderability of the fan club, it all kind of comes together in that William is trying to lead this normal life, but then he has... He, Somebody contacts him uh, claiming to know who he is and claiming to uh, tell people about it. And that just starts this whole chain of events. I don't want to give too much away. but t- So talk a little bit about the, the intertwining of um, how living the reality of a life for William and his sister as children of a serial killer and then this this intertwining of the, the person that comes out of the woodwork to try to um, – try to tell the world who they who they are and then I'm trying not to give too much away because more happens after that but can you talk a little bit about yeah. that intertwining yeah well I think we can say that he's accused of a terrible crime and because of that uh, William begins to he has he in effect is faced with looking like his father he's faced with uh, his his children's lives being shattered because they're accused because he's accused of that and then he has to come to terms with everything that happened to himself as a child. Um, and when the call comes through, of, of course, um, he he realizes that his whole past could be exposed, um, and he really tries to prevent that from happening. Um, what what the book does is it slowly intertwines his past and what he and his sister experienced as children, how it shattered their lives and how that might shatter his children's lives in the present as well as destroy the life he's built from it. Um, I, I gradually introduce this so that you come to understand why he is so afraid of his vast, his, of that past coming to light again, and that we kind of begin to sympathize more with him as well, even with his, even with his mother and his sister and even his father. Um, I, it's gra- done gradually through the book because um, I I, uh, I think it was a huge challenge in terms of pace in the book of when you introduce these kinds of past events and how you keep the mystery of the story and the thriller aspect of the story moving forward at the same time that you delve into the character of William, his sister, mother, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, so. What kinds of research then did you do for the book? Um, I did a lot of research on the children of serial killers uh, because if you look at some of these people, they've had very, very difficult lives. Uh, for instance, uh, Keith uh, Jesperson was known as the happy face killer. Melissa Moore, his daughter, wrote a book called Shattered Silence, which is a, it's a, it's, she had a very difficult time with all of this. And um, I also looked at Carrie Rawson, who is the daughter of BTK, that's Dennis Rader, who uh, who killed 10 people. What you find is that, for the most part, most of these children had no idea what their father was doing. Uh, it comes as a complete shock to them. Their, their life is totally shattered, uh, and it seems like everything they lived up to that point is a lie because of the, of the terrible things their, their fathers have done. Um, they also have incredible guilt of how could I have lived with a serial killer and not seen it? And really, how could I love this man um, who did this ter- these terrible things? Um, they all want to protect their own children, and they, of course, wonder whether there's some kind of gene inside them uh, they, that uh, they're going to pass on to their children or that's going to explode in they, them, the, themselves. There are lots of other people, too. The daughter of Edward and Wayne Edwards, he killed five people, including one of his sons. She couldn't face up to this until she was 48 and then submitted her DNA to the police and they arrested her father. Uh, Rose and Mae West, um, they would shut their children in the basement while they were killing people upstairs. And still, you know, it becomes almost a part of a normal part of young children's lives. 
Um, the daughter remembers that uh, Rose West, who, who participated in the killings, she also made phenomenal bunt cakes for each of their birthdays. So these horrible contradictions. Uh, Gary Ridgway, his son, he was the Green River killer. He remembers him as being a, a great soccer coach. Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you reconcile that kind of warm feeling for your father with the terrible things he did? And that's kind of the conflict throughout the book. Yeah, and you you actually wrote an article on this uh, called "The Hard Life of a Child of a Serial Killer." Um, I, I found it on your Facebook page, and it's. It, it's not something that we probably think of very often of how I think we probably mostly just say, well, how could you not know as opposed to, well, okay, this is someone that you love and who's cared for you, et cetera. There's always more than one side to a story. Right. Right. And uh, some people compare it to PTSD uh, because when, these children seem to live fairly normal lives until their, their fathers are discovered. And then it's a horrible trauma, like going to war, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. And from there on in, the lives are very difficult. Um, It's interesting, Ted Bundy's daughter, he had a daughter. Um, Nobody knows her name or where she lives. And uh, hopefully she's living a more normal life because of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully that can stay a secret because I can can only imagine then, you know, that's where we get that's where we get the jumping off point for this book um, yes. when that secret is exposed. So you mentioned that you like, that you tend to set your books in the world of banking. Are there other autobiographical elements in this book? Um, there are some, I worked as a private banker and uh, actually <laughs> the, the private bank described in the book has some of the same uh, decorations as one of the banks I worked with and they've, since uh, redecorated the whole floor, not because of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that uh, certainly that. Um, I grew up as a Christian scientist, so uh, I strayed from the religion after high school, but I certainly uh, can feel for the way uh, a person would have felt growing up in it and, um, and even looking at it in high school. Um, there are some scenes set in Colombia and, Alge- and Algeria, and um, I uh, learned my Spanish in Colombia. I traveled there for many, many years. Um, in Algeria, I used to travel there when I was an international banker uh, for a Canadian bank. Um, let's see. Those are those are really the uh, the any autobiographical side of it. My father was never a serial killer. <laughs> my, that you know my of. Mother, <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was a little different. <laughs> no, he was. Uh, he, he was a business owner and and devoted many many years for helping the YMCA. So he was not at all like this father. Right. And uh, my my mother was a, a devout Christian Scientist, but she was not nearly as fanatical as the woman in in this story. But but then she didn't have as much to protect and try and heal herself from. Right. So. Right. Are you interested in photography yourself? Is that um, is that any kind of a hobby, or was that just something that you you researched for the book? You know, it was something I researched for the book. I'm I'm starting to take some some classes, and um, it was a weakness originally in the book. Um, one of the agents I sent it to said you never really developed uh, the photography side of it. And I was kind of afraid to because it's it's a really creepy part of the book. Um, but uh, so I tackled it and I sent away for a National Geographic course on photography and uh, used some of those elements in it. But I'm I'm really not a professional photographer at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and also there's some, some interesting things too because I looked at a lot of photography books. And uh, there's some famous photographs that Harvey D- Dean Cogan mirrored. Uh, one of those is the Frank, the Robert Frank trolley picture. Um, it's one of it's in the book The Americans, and it's probably his most famous photograph of uh, people on a trolley car. And that is one of the images that the, the book turns on. Uh, there's a Ray Mann photo 
of a woman holding up a mask, and um, Harvey Dean Kogan had a woman instead holding up a pair of shoes. There's a Rodchenko trumpet player, very famous photo that was uh, done in a, in a warped or copied in a warped way in the book as well. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our second break of the podcast. I will say I don't know a lot about photography, uh, except that I'm not great at it. I'm just a a point and shoot and hope for the best kind of person. I don't know much about framing and lighting and all that great stuff. But the way that the pictures are described in the book and the way that they are, the the different famous pictures and um, Harvey Dean Kogan's work are interwoven throughout the story is really well integrated, really natural. I didn't feel like I was was struggling with the photography concepts. And so I think that Carl did a really great job with that portion of it. As I said, we are going to take that second break. When I come back, I'll be talking more with Carl about uh, his writing, how he got into writing, how he published this novel, his advice, all those great follow-up questions that I like to be nosy and ask my authors. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with Carl Vondero. You mentioned that you've been writing for a long time. Um, it, so it's clearly something that you've always wanted to do. When did you, um, how did it come about that you were able to then write and get this book published? Well, um, it, I... I had been a banker. That was my career in banking. And the whole time I was secretly writing crime novels, uh, which is is not the the best thing for your career advancement in banking, if people know about it. (laughs) So, uh, But uh, I wrote two other books before this, and they weren't published. Uh, Then I started working on this book, and uh, I I've been going to writers conferences in San Diego. We moved here from Montreal in 2005 and was going to writers conferences. And in the process, I met uh, Jacqueline Michard, who wrote The The Deep End of the Ocean. Mm -hmm. This was the the first book that was chosen by Oprah. And uh, she had some real financial difficulties. So she was doing some editing, and uh, she helped me with uh, some developmental editing editing on the book, a lot of editing. Learned really a a huge amount from her in terms of book structure, and and she actually was the one that suggested the moniker of the Praying Hands for uh, Harvey Dean Coben. Um, So that was a great help. Uh, And then I had, you know, I've gone to conferences, I have a writer's group, and that really helped a lot as well. So it took about four years. To write the book, and then uh, and it's a, it's just a long saga. But you find that for first books, for many many authors, you hear the same story. Um, I got an agent in New York, a very well known agent, and uh, we went through revisions for a year. And then he decided that um, he was not the agent for me. And so then I went into a <laughs> I went into another conference on how to pitch your book. It's amazing. Mm. There are actually conferences on how to pitch a book and how to boil it down to a, uh, an elevator paragraph, if you will. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, I went through that and I thought, really? You know, uh, do I really need this? And uh, then I went out to a conference in San Francisco, a writer's conference, and there were all these agents and editors and they're in a networking event and they're all having a glass of wine and gossiping together and I'm trying to wheedle my way into this group and one of these agents turns to me and she says, all right, describe your book in one sentence. Mm. I have it. And she (laughs) became my agent. She became my agent. So Michelle Richter of Fuse Literary. And uh, so, you know, you find the right agent who really champions the book and we had all kinds of publishers that were interested in the book, uh, but a lot of them turned it down. And uh, finally, Midnight Inc. came through, and they turned out to be the right publisher for the book. They were owned by Llewellyn. And so out of that uh, that journey, do you have advice for other aspiring authors? Well, I tell people um, tenacity is more important than talent. <laughs> Uh, because it is a long road and is just full of revision. Um, I, you, a writer has to be patient, and most of the books that are sent out to editors and agents aren't really ready. Uh, but it's very hard for a writer to tell that. So I advise people to get into writers groups, go to conferences, submit the, their first pages to editors and agents, um, and then when the book, you've got a reasonable, a reasonable version of the book, get a good editor to help you see uh, where the problems are and the, the places where it doesn't hold together. So all of that takes time and it takes some money, but um, I think that's, that's the way to go if you're going to be traditionally published. And I think traditional publishing is, is, is where, uh, where the best books are published. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the book comes out July 8th, so we're just about a month out. Uh, do you have plans for the, the release? Yes. Uh, I'm going to be doing, um, well, I, I'm going to be a debut author in Thriller Fest, um, and the book's coming out just a few days before that, and that's a whole that's a whole conference just for thriller writers and fans in New York. It's a great conference. And then from there, I will be having a launch of the book at Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore here in San Diego um, on June 28th. And a week before that, I will be signing books as well in Warwick here in San Diego. So those are the events I've got planned so far. We're also planning to do a uh, uh, we're planning to do a fundraiser uh, with some other authors um, for Traveling Stories, a nonprofit I work with. So that'll be part of it probably in August. Okay. That's actually the perfect segue because I was just about to ask you about the nonprofit work that you do. You'd mentioned it before we'd started recording. Um, so talk a little bit more about that nonprofit work. Sure. Uh, I've always been involved with nonprofits. Uh, in high school, when I graduated, uh, I went and worked for the YMCA in Colombia. Uh, and that street orphans, foster parent plans, it was really kind of a life-changing experience, and I ended up devoting most of my career to Latin America. So I have a real loyalty to the YMCA. I worked with them in Montreal. I worked with them a lot here in San Diego. Um, San Diego YMCA is the second largest YMCA in the country. And I, uh, you know, I was um, I, uh, the chair for one of the branches here, and we worked with them in terms of helping them establish partnerships overseas. Um, I've also worked and am more engaged now in something called Social Venture, Venture Partners, which is a nationwide organization where we, for free, help nonprofits uh, with the way they're their operations and how they work. So say they're, how they manage their boards, how they do strategic planning, et cetera. So I've been very involved in that as well. And uh, I'm also involved in the Sisters in Crime chapter here in San Diego, which is called Partners in Crime. Uh, so we're all mystery writers, group of people. We get together and talk about killing other people. Uh, <laughs> And we're going to be putting on the uh, a conference next year called Left Coast Crime, 
where mystery writers from all of North America will be getting together here in San Diego. So those are the three nonprofits I'm involved with right now. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, and then uh, you, you sound like you're very busy, but when you have time to read, do you have favorite authors or genres? I do. Um, I don't read many of the the old classics. Probably should, but I don't. Uh, I'm not much of a science fiction fan, and I've read some history, but I'm more of a fiction fan. And I read uh, literary fiction as well as uh, as as well as mystery and thrillers. Uh, so, for instance, one of my favorite books is Daniel Woodwell's Winter's Bone, which uh, the mm-hmm. movie was based on, and it's just a great book. Uh, like Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carry, is just an incredible book about Vietnam. Um, John Le Carre, The Little Drummer Girl, is one of my favorites. Thomas Harris, of course, Silence of the Lambs, uh, which you know has some similarities to my own book. Um, Jacqueline Machard's Deep End of the Ocean is a wonderful book. So those, those are a few. Oh, also Adrian McKinty. Um, not many know, know him. He's a thriller writer, an Irish thriller writer, but he wrote mm-hmm. a book called The Dead Yard, which is just terrific. It's, you know, it's a Romeo and Juliet uh, uh, a protagonist with a prosthetic leg falling in love with a gang's daughter, um, and he's infiltrated the gang. It's, it's really good. So mm-hmm. those are a few. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I know that you have a website, so if you can tell people where to find the website as well as where to find you on social media, that would be great. Sure. So it's it's Carl Vondero, C-A-R-L-V-O-N-D-E-R-A-U dot com. Um, and uh, I'm also on uh, Facebook, author Carl Vondero as well. I'm Amazon author. Um, I'm not as active on Twitter yet but uh, hopefully more in the future. And um, I've got a publicist to JKS, Ellen Zielinski winfield So um, those are, I think that covers those. Okay, I've also, great. On my, oh. One thing on my website I want to say too is um, a lot of people are what are called left-brainers like me, very analytical people, and uh, we have the misconception that we can't be creative. Um, and so I have started uh, a series of tips on my website called uh, Tips for the Left Brainer, Creativity Tips for the Left Brainer. And each week it's going on with a different tip of how you can open up more that creative side of yourself. Okay. And that's, I'm, I'm just looking at your website. That's under the blog uh, right. headline, right? Yes. Okay. Right. Oh, nice. Right. Interesting. So we've talked about quite a few things um, from the book to writing, et cetera. But is there anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to mention? Uh, I don't think so. I think we've, we've, we've covered just about everything. Okay, wonderful. Well, it has been great to talk to you. Um, as I said, the book is Murderabilia, and it comes out July 8th. Um, it's, 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 available, it's available for pre-order on Amazon and other okay. booksellers. So and it's it's, it's it's really good. I I enjoyed it a lot. Um, just yeah, very very um, it's it's a page turner and it's it's creepy in a lot of ways. But I mean, creepy in a good thriller sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I'm going to say that that interview, I know, cut off a little abruptly and strangely with me saying thank you and then no follow up. But uh, Carl did say thank you. There was just a weird glitch in the recording and I had to cut that part out. So I apologize for that uh, random abrupt ending. But thank you so much to my guest, Carl Vondero, for joining me to talk about his debut novel, Murderabilia. As I mentioned, it comes out on July 8th. But if you want to read it ahead of time, you can enter to win the you can enter to win a copy of Murderabilia. It's very easy. You just have to go to our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That is GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And comment on episode 158, Interview with Carl Vondero. Also, please go ahead and share that post when you do that. I would really appreciate it, like it, um, you know, do all those wonderful things that help us out on social media. But in order to enter the contest this week, let's go ahead and just do commenting on 
episode 158, interview with Carl Vondero. Again, you can go to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Those links are in the show description, and they are also on our website, or you can just type us into your uh, your social media page and find us no problem. Thank you so much for listening. I so appreciate you, my listeners. I appreciate all of the authors that come on the podcast as well. I so love talking to them and hearing their stories, and I hope that you enjoy it as well. Join me again on Thursday when I'll be talking about a couple of books that I've been reading for a group that I can't mention on the podcast because it's a family podcast and I'm not allowed to swear and this one has a swear word. So uh, we'll call it Reading <clears throat> Whole Countries. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about two of the books that we've been reading in that group. So join me for that episode on Thursday. No, actually Friday. I said Thursday twice, but that episode will be on Friday. So join me on Friday. In the meantime, have a great week and go out and get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.